Working hard is very important. You're not going to get anywhere without working hard. George Lucas. The price of success is hard work. Vince Lombardi. Nothing ever comes to one that is worth having, except as a result of hard work. Booker T. Washington. There is no substitute for hard work. Thomas Edison. Now, these axioms are axioms that most of us were raised by. This is how your mother taught you, your father taught you, that there's no substitute for hard work. And especially if you grew up in the Pennsylvania Dutch culture, guess what? You were born at two days old, they handed you a shovel, and you keep that shovel in your hand till you're 102 and in the grave. That's the way it goes. Work, work, work. There is no good substitute for hard work. And I want to tell you something this morning. That's very true in almost every area of life except one. And that is in our life with God. When it comes to our life with God, when it comes to the matter of, of the forgiveness of our sin, when it comes to a matter of a, a new life, when it comes to the matter of getting into heaven, friends, I want to tell you something. There is a substitute for hard work. And there had better be. Because none of us here can work our way into the favor of God. None of us here could ever possibly hope to earn our way into a new life. None of us here can do enough to justify getting in to the gates of heaven. In fact, we can't work our way. We have to go by way of God's gracious gift, and that gift is called his saving grace. This morning, I want to invite you to turn in the scriptures to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And, and in this sermon series on grace, I want us to unpack this morning the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In a passage that many of you know, a passage that's very powerful, that's going to teach us who we are before we come to know Christ, who we are after we come to know Christ, and, and what that truth is, how grace affects and impacts and transforms our lives. Ephesians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles or your device, would you open and let's read the Word of God. As for you, you were dead in your right transgressions and sins, Paul writes, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In order for us to even begin to understand the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we need to begin to understand who we are apart from Jesus Christ. And apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, every one of us, according to verses 2 and 3, are dead in sin. Let me tell you, in the next couple minutes, you're going to hear phrases that really are almost discouraging at times. You hear them, you say, wow, is that true? Is that really how we are? And the answer to that is, absolutely, that is how we are. Listen, apart from Jesus Christ... We are dead in sin, and we are disobedient to the ways of God. Now, we may be very much alive physically. We may be very much alive mentally. But across, apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, every one of us are spiritually dead. Our spirits do not acknowledge, nor do they desire, nor do they follow the one true and living God of the universe. And as a result of that, we live in our disobedience to the ways of God. That's what the Word of God teaches in verse 2 of Ephesians chapter 2. Now, how does that work out? What does that look like in our lives? Well, in the same way that the Ephesians were disobedient to God, so we are disobedient to God. There really is no change in those 2,000 years from the time when this was written to this day here in Willow Street. We are disobedient to the ways of God, for example, according to the scriptures, when we follow the ways of the world. 
Now, when Paul talks about the ways of the world, what he's referring to are the standards, the values, if you will, the worldviews that are prominent in the world around us. Divorced from any kind of relationship with Jesus Christ, they are the values, the standards, the worldviews that are developed because someone said, oh, I like this. I think this is how we should live our lives. Let me give you a couple examples that are very prominent in the world around us. One of them is, listen, you're number one. And if you don't look out for number one, no one is going to look out for number one. And so that is a very prominent worldview today. And, and if you think about that worldview, just multiply that by millions of people, and suddenly you realize that you could potentially have millions of self-centered, very selfish people who are simply looking out for number one. They really don't care about you or you or you. All they care about is me. And you know what that leads to in our society? It leads to deep division. It leads to deep conflict. It leads to an unhealthy and ungodly experience of daily living. Because of that view, you're number one. Watch out for you because if you don't, no one else is going to. Now, out of that flows another worldview. And, and that worldview is simply stated, if it feels good, do it. And sadly, in our world, a lot of people live their lives by that worldview, if it feels good, do it. I'll tell you something. Your emotions are never a good guide. They are never a good director for your life. Do you know that? You don't want to live by that kind of worldview, where if it feels good, do it. Because listen, it might feel good in the moment, but it might be the worst thing that you could possibly do, and it could destroy your life and destroy your relationships and destroy the people around you. There is also in this culture that we live in, we talked about this a few weeks ago, a world view that's called the cancel culture. And the way that works is if 25 years ago Mike Sigmund did or said something that was truly wrong and sinful and it was recorded in writing or on a video or on a photograph and, and since that time Mike Sigmund has turned and repented of that and has sought the forgiveness of those who were hurt by it and, and tried to, to live out a life that is different than, than that behavior, that action, that whatever might have demonstrated 25 years ago. If it surfaces in our culture, guess what? You're canceled. It really doesn't matter that, that your life has changed. It doesn't matter that you've, you've, you've sought forgiveness, that you've tried to, to, to turn the corner and turn a page and, and live a different way. You're canceled because of what you did 25 years ago because that worldview says, there is no way that I'm going to forgive you. I don't need to forgive you, and I will not forgive you. Friends, listen, we disobey God when we follow the ways of the world, the worldviews, the standards, the values of the world. We also disobey God when we follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Look at verse 2. The ruler of the kingdom of the air is Satan, the devil. And, and, and you know, I say that this morning, and, and you sit here and you say, yeah, I'm not a follower of the devil, and, and none of us are. I, I understand that, and yet all of us are. All of us are because, listen, the very first time you lied, you were following the first liar. And the first liar is the devil. Anytime any one of us give in to temptation and follow the, temp the tempter, we are following the devil. I've been in ministry long enough where I've sat across tables from people who've been caught in sin, and we've dealt with that sin. And once in a while, someone will look at me and they will say with all sincerity, I don't know why God let me do that. And man, when I hear that, I'll just be honest with you, I want to jump up and just shake the person and say, what do you mean? You don't know but I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor and I'm calm and I'm reserved. And so I sit there and I say, what did you just say? And then they repeat it for me. And then I say, oh, oh my God, God has nothing to do with this. Listen, the word of God says God is not a tempter. He will neither tempt you to sin. It is not God who lets you do this. Well, the devil made me do it. No, no, no. The devil doesn't make you do anything. Listen, there is power 
power that God gives us to resist the devil, to say no to temptation, amen? And you could have said no to that temptation. You gave in to it, and listen, if you're gonna be able to recover from this, you have to admit that you are the one who gave in to the temptation. God didn't do it, the devil didn't do it. Yes, when we sin, sometimes we are following the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Thirdly, when we disobey, we also tend to follow our own natural desires and instincts. The, the things that arise out of our sinful nature. We don't have time to look at the scripture this morning, but in Galatians chapter 5, there's a list of the desires of the sinful nature. And the reality is that, that when we disobey God, there are times that we are disobeying God because we are choosing to follow those natural desires of the sinful nature. Now hear me when I say this. Not one of us here, not one of us here were born perfect. Every one of us are born with a sinful nature. From our conception until we go home to be with Jesus, there is a sinful nature in every one of us, according to Galatians chapter 5. When you are a Christian, that sinful nature rears its ugly heads at times, and it does battle as the Holy Spirit of God is within you, telling you no, and the sinful nature is telling you yes. The sinful nature is powerful in every one of us, because we are born with a sinful nature. I have a seven-month-old granddaughter, and she is absolutely the apple of my eye. She is beautiful. She is cute. If you take a picture of me when I was six months old and you hold it up next to her, right, Jenny? She... <laughs> that, was, that was a rhetorical question, not one for you to know, no, no. I personally think that she looks just like me when I was six months old. Apparently, I'm the only one who thinks that out of the two who are present this morning, and I will get texts later on informing me otherwise as well. She is absolutely perfect in her papa's eyes, but she's not. She's not. And if she hasn't already, at some point, Macy Kate is going to throw a temper tantrum. And, and you wonder where the temper tantrum comes from. Friends, listen, it comes out of our sinful nature. Neither Katie nor Brent, neither Jenny nor I ever will say to Macy, Kate, listen, if you don't like what mommy and daddy say, this is what you do. And we don't throw ourselves on the floor, flail our hands and our feet. I wouldn't be able to get up if I did this. And then say, this is what you do when you don't like what mommy and daddy tell you. Nobody teaches children to. Where do they get it? It's that ingrained sinful nature within us and it manifests itself through life. When we disobey God and his ways, we are following the natural desires of our sinful nature. We are following the ruler of the kingdom of the air. We are following the ways of the world. Now, the picture I just painted for you is like, oh my goodness, Mike, that's like desperately terrible. And it is. In fact, we call it total depravity. Apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, every one of us are totally depraved. We are totally sinful. You know what that means? That means that none of us have within us the ability, the power to earn our way into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. None of us have within us the ability, the power, the goodness, whatever it takes in order to secure the forgiveness of our sins and a new and eternal life with Jesus Christ. In fact, Steve Farrer in his excellent book, Finishing Strong, talks about how sin is a relentless master that ruins our lives. And this is what he writes. It's so powerful. He says, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you're willing to pay. That's what sin does to you. So the question is, is there any hope? Is there any hope? And you know what? The worship team got ahead of me on this because you already sang about the hope. The second song, I mean, you came out of the gate and you were singing and worshiping the Lord. Who is our living hope? His name is? That's our hope. Our hope 
is in Jesus Christ. And the truth of God's word, look at verses 4 and 5, is this, that because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in sin, it is by grace that you have been saved. The truth of God's word is that God has a remedy for sin. God has a, a solution for the condition of sin, and that is called salvation. Salvation through Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. And as he hung on that cross, he bore in his body the sins of every person. Friends, he bore in his body the sins of the entire Ashway family. He bore in his body the sins of Bill and Jackie Stoner. He bore in his body Joanne's sin. He bore in his body the sins of the Wallace family. He bore in his body the sins of the Schneider family. He took all of our sin upon himself. And at that moment as he hung on that cross, you remember it, don't you? When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me at that moment? He was cut off from his holy Father in heaven because of the sins of the world. He bore your sins, and he bore my sins, and he went to his death paying the penalty for our sins into a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he rose again, the victor over sin and death and the evil one. Jesus Christ purchased the victory by his precious blood on the cross at Calvary and his powerful resurrection from the grave. This is what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 5. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a right person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, he died for us. He didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up. He didn't wait for us to get our act together. He understood that there was no way that we would ever, ever be saved if he did not take the first action and die in our place for our sins on the cross. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the gift of salvation is a gift by which not only are our sins forgiven, but our lives are transformed from the inside out. We are given the gift of becoming a son or daughter of God. We are adopted into his family. We are filled with his Holy Spirit. We are made members of his holy church. We then receive the witness of his spirit so that we can know that we know that we know that our sins are forgiven and that someday when we die, we will go home to be with heaven, with him in heaven. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be quizzical. I wonder if that's going to happen, actually. We can know with absolute certainty that we will go to be with Jesus in heaven. But why? Why did he do that? Why in the world, if indeed we are totally depraved, sinful, disobedient, apart from Jesus, why did God ever decide to go to such a length to love us and to save us by sending his only son? Why did Jesus die on the cross? I think we already learned it wasn't something good in us that prompted him to act. It was something good in him that prompted him to act. And that good thing is his good grace. It was the grace of God by which God acted on our behalf, sent his son to die in our place, and offers to us the gift of salvation. It is by the grace of God that that gift becomes a reality in your life and my life. It isn't something we can earn. It isn't something we deserve. Grace is the undeserved, unmerited love and favor of God. Uh, Jenny and I are, are right now going through some photographs from Aunt Janet's home, old photographs from um, years gone by in our family. And my mother's family, the Giese family in York, I, I actually forgot about this until the other day, had this wonderful Christmas tradition. When I was growing up, on Christmas night, we would always drive over to York and spend the evening in my uh, grandfather's home in the city of York. 
and my mother's brothers and sisters would come and all the cousins would be there. And every year, one of us would be chosen by lot to receive the big gift. And the way the big gift worked was that they would bring out this big box, and I mean it was big. It was usually about that big. And it was wrapped and, and we would get, whoever would be chosen would get that gift, and you'd open that gift, and you'd open the box, and inside there was a gift and another box. And, and then you'd open that second box, and inside that box was a gift and another box. And that's how it went, a gift and a box, a gift and a box. And this went on for about 12 layers, gifts and boxes. Fun gifts, silly gifts, expensive gifts, inexpensive gifts, all kinds of things until you got to the very bottom. And when I saw that picture and I saw my aunt opening this and, and, and having a lot of fun with it, it reminded me that that's exactly the way God's grace is. His grace is just like that. Listen, when you get the big box of, of God's grace, when he, when he offers it to you as a free gift, listen, you take that. Because when you start to open that gift of his grace, you're going to find that inside is the gift of love. And then there's going to be another box. And when you open that, you're going to find inside of that mercy. And then there's another box. And you're going to open that. And you're going to find kindness. And there's another box. And that's going to be faithfulness. And there's another box. And inside that's going to be goodness. And another box. And inside that, there's going to be a note that says, no condemnation. And inside that, you're going to open another box. And it's going to say, I won't cast up your sin. I'll remember it no more. And there will be another box. And you open that. And it will say, help with everything in your life because I will never leave you and forsake you. And inside that, there will be another box and it will say hope for eternity. And that is the grace of God. It's amazing. It's the gift that keeps on giving. It's the gift that you don't ever want to reject because God is offering it to you. He is not asking for payment. He is giving it to you, not because you earned it, not because you deserve it, Jake, but because he loves you and he wants you to have it and he wants you to open it and he wants you to experience all he has for you. That is the grace of God, amen? That's the grace of God. I want to tell you something. There isn't one single work you can do to earn it or receive it or achieve it. We are not saved by works. We are saved by grace. And look at the word of God in Ephesians 2, and not by works, lest anyone should boast. Can you imagine if the path to salvation was works? And if somehow we knew that it took 545 works to get saved, can you imagine how unbearable we would be with each other? Well, guess what I got to last night? I'm at 545 works. And Andy, you're only at 517. So Andy, you better hurry up and catch up with me. I mean, can you imagine that kind of behavior in the body of Christ? Because we would be boasting about how much we've done, how far we are, and you poor soul, how far you have to go. And God says, no way. Salvation is not by works, so that no one boasts. It is by the grace of God. Amen. What about works, Mike? Works are good. That's why they're called good works. They're good, and, and you want to do them. But listen, if you look at verse 10, you'll notice that, that good works have their place, and, and their place is as an expression or an evidence of our salvation. They are not intended as the way to earn our salvation. They are intended as the way to display to others that we're saved. What about religious acts? Let me tell you a story about my mother. My mother, as, as you know, was raised in York, and she was raised in a church that was a little different, well, a lot different, than my father's church over in Conestoga. So she was raised in a church where she was baptized as a baby, where at the age of 12, she entered into what was called a confirmation class, and she was in that confirmation class for two years, and she was confirmed at the age of 14. Now, if you want to verify that, I have that in a frame back in my office, and you can see it back there along with all the other stuff that I save. And there it is. She was confirmed, age of 14. When she was confirmed, she became a member of that church. When she became a member of that church, she received a little pamphlet that told her what a member should do. A member should attend regularly. A member should give a tithe. A member should also do works in the church, volunteer, serve, and places in the church. 
When my mother married my father in 1955, and she crossed the gate, great chasm called the Susquehanna River and settled in Lancaster County, rescued, we used to say she was rescued out of York into Lancaster, she began, hey, oh, that's right, you're from, yeah, that makes sense. So, when, when she started going to my dad's church in Conestoga, she would hear people say things like, well, when I was saved, or when Jesus Christ came into my life and saved me, and, and people would give testimonies like this, and she would sit there and she'd say to herself, I, yeah, I, I don't have that. You know, I, I went to a class, I have this knowledge. I know about how Jesus died, I know about how he rose again, I know the Bible stories, but I, what do you mean when you were saved? And so in, in our church in Conestoga, Bethel E.C. Church, she, she learned that, that her church took her so far, but not far enough. They gave her knowledge. But they never explained to her that you need to take that knowledge and respond to it. That God offers you his grace, but he also gives you a gift called faith so that you can respond back to his grace by confessing your sin to him and believing that all of these truths about Jesus Christ are indeed true. And because he did die for you, Veronica, and rose again from the dead, Jesse, and because he lives today and offers to you, Joyce, and Randy, the free gift of salvation, that you need to respond to that. And you need to confess your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so that you too might be saved. And I remember it was just days before my mom went home to be with the Lord, and, and she actually went home in an untimely way in an accident. And so it wasn't that we were having a conversation because, you know, we were concerned about whether she was going to heaven or not. It was just that we were talking about the things of the Lord. And I remember her saying to me, I am so grateful that I know that when I die, I will go home to be with Jesus Christ in heaven. Not because of the religion that I had growing up, but because of the relationship that I have as I believed in and trusted, surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. This morning, I have a question for you. Do you know that you know that you know that your sins are forgiven and you have a new and eternal life in Christ? As you sit here this morning, can you say, and we sang it as we opened, I'm saved. Not by anything I've done, but by the grace of God, I have trusted in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and he has changed my life. Let's pray. Jesus, we're thankful for the knowledge that you give us through your word, the understanding that we've received from Ephesians chapter 2 and from the whole of Scripture about this great gift that you've given us, the gift of salvation. We're thankful, Jesus, that you died in our place for our sins on the cross, that you rose again that you live today, that you offer to us the free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of our sin, and a new and eternal life. I thank you, Lord, for every man and woman, every young person, every child that is here this morning, for whom their testimony is, didn't earn it, don't deserve it. I'm so grateful 
for the gift of salvation that Jesus has given me. I received it, and I know, I know that I'm saved. I'm thankful for every man and woman who has that testimony in their heart, on their lips this morning. Lord, I want to pray right now for those who are online with us, those in overflow, those who are here in the sanctuary who may not have that testimony, may not have that assurance of salvation. And whose heart you've opened this morning, as they've come to realize it's not the works, it's not the religion, this is what's missing. I need to believe and entrust in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the gift he is giving me by his grace, the gift of salvation. If you're here this morning and you are ready to make that step and to receive that gift, you're done working, you're done with the religion, you're ready to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, either you're here online, you're here in the building, you're ready to confess your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and surrender your life to him, then I'm going to lead you in a prayer by which you can confess that to the Lord. And I invite you to pray this prayer in the sincerity of your heart. It's a prayer of salvation, a prayer to receive God's gift of grace and salvation. If that's your desire this morning and you're online, I just invite you to click that button that says raise a hand. And if you're here in the sanctuary and overflow, if you would just lift up your hand so that I or a pastor might see, just to know as your response, I'm ready to pray and receive Christ, Mike. Just slip your hand up if that's your desire this morning. And I'm going to lead you then in a prayer that you can pray quietly in your heart to receive Christ. Are there any who with an upraised hand would just indicate their desire to trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Then I invite you to pray this prayer. Lord, I thank you for your great love for me and for the gift of your grace and salvation. I thank you, Jesus, that you died in my place for my sins and that you are alive today. I confess my sin to you, and I turn away from my sin and turn to you. I confess, Jesus, that you are Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. I receive from you, Jesus, today the gift of salvation, grace, I thank you for that gift. I surrender myself to you. I want to be your follower. I want to live my life for you. Thank you that you would love me and give this gift to me. In your name I pray. Lord, I praise you, thank you. Glorify your name for the gift of salvation for those who have prayed today to receive this gift. And today are beginning their walk with you, their life with you. I also pray for every one of us who have long been Christians that our hearts be so filled with gratitude today as we are reminded that there isn't a thing we could have done, but it's all by your grace that our lives have been changed and transformed, that we're living daily walking faithfully with you. It's amazing. God, you could have done anything you wanted with us. And anything you would have done with us would have been right because you're perfect. But what you chose was grace. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. And we rise to sing our praise for his grace. Let's stand together.